Good morning. Welcome to Fort Laramie Country Church. We're going to do this outside today. It's just too beautiful a day not to seize the moment. If you were with us last week, we talked about purpose. And we talked about how a lot of times God uses our weaknesses and our flaws to glorify Him. We're going to be using the same text today. We're going to build on purpose just a little bit. But we're going to be talking about how we're all in the ministry. Before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, give us eyes to see. Help us understand what you're trying to teach us here in your word. May we not miss what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Same text. Jesus here is going along, and there's a blind man there, and his disciples ask a question. We'll read all this again. We started last week. John 9, 1 through 5. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. That's Jesus. His, Jesus went along with his disciples. There was a guy who'd been blind from birth, begging. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. I am the light of the world. The verse we're going to touch on today or pick up on today is verse 4. As long as it is day. That day represents opportunity. Today is the day of opportunity. We only get one chance at this life. I have used an illustration before where I handed some young people a dollar bill and I said, you, you, this is your dollar bill and you can spend it any way you want to spend it, but you only get to spend it once. I can remember as a young man uh, going out to shoot gophers on my Uncle Pete's and my brother and I'd get dad to take us and he'd go by the gas station and buy a, a box of 22 shells. They were about 15 cents at the time and we thought we had a treasure. We didn't waste those 22 shells. We had gophers to shoot. We didn't go out plinking. We only had one opportunity with those shells and we were going to take advantage of every one of them. That's what he's saying here. This, this day represents our opportunity. As long it is, as it is day, we we must do the work of him who sent me. You know, Jesus knew his purpose. He really did. Jesus knew why he was here on earth, and he gives us that reason is to do the work of him who sent me. Now, obviously, he was also headed for the cross. That was God's will. Even when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, not my will be done, but your will be done, Father. And, and he knew it. Jesus knew the reason he came. He knew his purpose. It gave him motive. It gave him direction. It gave him reason. And, and, and that's what we're dealing with here. But he used uh, an interesting word here. Uh, some translations say I. Uh, the Greek word here is, is hamas. It's plural. It's us. Jesus is including his disciples in his purpose. Jesus said our purpose. Your purpose is the same as my purpose. They understood this. They grasped it. In fact, John 9, 4 in the Living Bible says it this way. All of us must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent me. Jesus is saying all of us must do the work of our Father. We, we're task-oriented. We understand that. We have to-do lists. Uh, we follow schedules. We get, we get on to the next thing. We understand tasks. So what is, what is the, the task or our assignment? It's doing ministry. It really is. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're in the ministry. In fact, they did a study over 10 years, and they asked 50,000 people uh, why they came to church. And 75 to 90 percent of the, the people responded this way. The reason they went to church, 2% said they saw advertisement on TV or radio or something. 6% said a pastor invited them. 6% said it was because some big program, uh, something went on where they were invited to some evangelism campaign of some kind. 86% came because a friend or a relative invited them. This means that you're 
I, I, six percent came because a pastor invited him. Eighty-six percent came because a friend or relative invited him. That means you're eighty percent more effective at reaching people and getting in people into church than I am. They see me as a paid professional. They see you as a person who knows Jesus and cares. And that's amazing. You know, in fact, I feel I had more opportunity to witness to people before I was in the ministry. Uh, because they see me. You're supposed to say that. You're supposed to talk about that. You're a pastor. They didn't see me that way prior to the ministry when I was working com construction, working on a ranch. You know, uh, I, I felt more effective that way. You guys are in the ministry. Uh, I'm in the ministry too, but it's different than your ministry. Doing the work of the Father means we're going to be reaching out to people. Jesus was about to reach out to a blind man. If we're going to reach people, we're going to have to get involved with people's lives. We're going to, it's going to involve touch. You know, and this, I'm, I'm going to read to you another study here. And it was actually done on touch. And it was done before COVID hit us. And a guy by the name of Sidney Jared, uh, he did a study in, in coffee shops all over the world. And, and he sat for one hour and counted the number of times people touched. In Puerto Rico, in one hour, there was 180 times people touched. In France, 110 times. In the United States, two times. England, zero. You know, today, world, uh, we've, we've kind of almost got away from being in touch with people. We're missing it. We have auto banking. We have online shopping. We have internet, voicemail, texting, messaging. Uh, push one now. Push two now. Enter your card, your number. We don't even talk to people. We talk to machines. They actually have a word now. Uh, it's called touchphobic, the fear of being touched. If we're going to be in the ministry, we must reach out to people. We must touch people. Now, the, the, the hard part is we, we like our space. Uh, and it's going to demand time. And it's letting people get close to us. If we're going to do the work of Him who sent us, we must be willing to be involved with people. When we reach people, we are opening ourselves up. We're letting people in our space. We're giving people our time. We're letting people get close to us. And friends, that's exactly what Jesus did. We're in the same kind of ministry He is. We're in the people business. Night is coming. No one can work. Day represents opportunity. Night represents a loss of opportunity. You know, in fact, James 4.13 in the New King James says it this way. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Nancy and I went to a funeral yesterday of a lady who had passed away when she was 93 years old. But when she was eight, this is when we were in Torrington. We, 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 we were very we're close to the family. Uh, when we were in Torrington and ministering there, uh, I had an opportunity to get to know the lady. And when she was 88, I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord. And I was so glad at sitting at that funeral that I didn't miss that opportunity. I was so glad. In fact, David Jeremiah says it this way, The greatest enemy is not death, but a life unlived. I want to paraphrase that just a little bit. The greatest enemy is not death, but a life lived missing God's purpose. Then he goes on, verse 5. Well, I am in the world. I am the light of the world. We touched on this last week. And, and, but I want to build on it just a little bit more just because we ran out of time. Jesus knew his purpose was to be light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And now you are the light of the world. We're, we're not the light. We virtually reflect the light. Jesus is the light. 
Have you ever used a mirror, uh, been around a mirror? You can virtually reflect that light and all that energy, uh, but, but the mirror's not the light. It just reflects it. Have you ever looked down a well? The best way it isn't with a flashlight is to reflect that light off a mirror. And I can remember as a kid, <laughs> we used to play with those mirrors and they were kind of fun because you could flash light on people and it was bright. It was almost blinding. But that's why, not because the mirror was the light, because it reflected the light. Matthew 5, 14 and 16 says it this way. You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. You know... There's no mistaking uh, the, eff the, the effect light has on a dark place. Uh, there isn't. It, it dispels darkness. It, it really does. When the sun comes up in the morning, it dispels darkness. Darkness is overpowered by sunlight. Have, have you noticed lately how our world seems to be getting darker and darker you, you see it in the news you see it in the movies you see it in the way people talk and, and there's kind of a darkness we can't blame darkness that's what darkness does is be dark when there's no light it's just dark when we were on Elk Mountain Ranch, when we were managing Elk Mountain Ranch, the guy I worked for didn't want any lights. He didn't want any yard lights. In fact, when we built the house, he would actually drive around the ranch. We were about three miles off the county road, and he would look up in, we were, we were kind of living in a big quakey grove at that time at the base of Elk Mountain, and, and, and he would virtually drive around at all these points to make sure that at night, that when we built that house, there wouldn't have been no light seen from, from the windows and stuff, because he didn't have any yard lights. And I'm, and I'm telling you what, uh, at night when it was dark there, it was dark. Now, if the moon was out or the stars were out or, or something, it was light. But I can remember in the wintertime working at the office, and we were building a house, and in the meantime, we lived in another little log home that was a couple hundred yards away, and kind of through this, you had to go through the Quakey Grove to get there, and, and I'd remember you'd get working, and pretty soon be 5.30, and you'd head home, and I didn't have a flashlight. And as soon as I turned that office light out, it was pitch black. You couldn't even see your hand. Uh, that's how dark it was. And, and uh, I always worried about skunks. Walking into a skunk, figured that would be a nightmare. But anyway, just because it was dark, you never knew where you were going. It was really tough until I got just back to the house, and then I'd see the house light on, not the yard, not on a, you know, see the window and the, a light in the window, and I was able to, to trek on. But, but the only way I could remedy that darkness is to have a flashlight. Uh, uh, the, that was the only remedy. Uh, so, you know, if the world's becoming darker, we can't blame darkness. That's what darkness does. The problem is the absence of light. When Jesus arrived on earth, darkness was dispelled. The world was never the same. Jesus rocked the world by being light. Do you realize that the light, that the light, shines brighter the darker it is i've got a spotlight i use it at night sometimes out here and i'll glass it and see if what's out and about when i step out in the dark it's cool but if i step out here during the daytime and turn that spotlight on it has no it, you can't even tell it's on because there's no darkness and the darker it is at night when there's no moon and there's no stars or the or the clouds are out here i turn that spotlight on it's amazing it just brightens up crazy friends we have an opportunity like never before because of the darkness to shine to allow to allow jesus light to shine through us to be light to dispel darkness i don't know who said this but i like it it says lord set my light on fire set Wait, let me rephrase this. Let me read it again. I don't know who said this. Lord, set my life on fire so the world can watch me burn. Friends, that needs to happen. We're in the ministry. And if we're going to reach people, we need to be light. We need to be dispelling the darkness. We can, we can put a light on a lampstand when we tell other people what Jesus had done for us. That's how we're light. That's how that works. In fact, this poor blind guy, if you read the story, he was, he was healed and all of a sudden the Pharisees, the religious people of the day, they got pretty upset. They say, how can this Jesus heal people? He's a sinner. They questioned his parents that if that was even real. They got after him. This was his response to them. 
I do not know if he is a sinner or not. He's talking about Jesus. The man replied, One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. They couldn't argue with that. That guy was being light. Peter and John were, were being persecuted for telling about Jesus. And they got him and they said, You stop talking about Jesus and teaching about Jesus. Acts 4.20, the Living Bible says it this way. We cannot stop telling about the wonderful things we saw Jesus do and heard him say. They were being light. Here's another story of a guy that, that's being light. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. He, this guy wanted to go with Jesus. He, he, the, the demons, he'd been cast out of him. But Jesus sent him on his way. Return to your own home and tell what great things God has done for you. He went his way, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Friends, he just put his light on the lampstand. He was proclaiming light. He just turned the spotlight on. He was dispelling darkness. Friends, these guys all shined. And they're, when, when they told people about what Jesus had done in their life. Just like you and me, they were in the ministry with their light shining. We must do the work of Him who sent me if we're going to know our purpose. And that purpose is ministry. John 3.36 in the Living Bible says it this way, and all who trust Him, God's Son, to save them have eternal life. Those who don't believe and obey Him shall never see heaven, but the wrath of God remains on Him. Friend, I talked to you about us being just a vapor in James there. We're here for a second and gone. This right now is your only opportunity to put your trust and believe in Jesus Christ. It's your only opportunity. There's not going to be another chance. Well, it's day. You can do that right now, right where you are, by asking Jesus Christ into your heart and ask Him to forgive every sin you've ever forgiven. That's why He died on the cross. We can't come into the presence of God with sin. That has to be paid for. It has to be covered by the blood of Christ. He did that on the cross. Your part is to put your faith and trust in Him. It is that simple. He never made it complicated. He gave us a plan to see heaven. He play, gave us a plan to go to heaven. And His name is Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, do that. And if you'd like to know more at the end of this video, you're going to see our phone number. Get a hold of me. Message us on, on, on Facebook. Say you want to talk. We'd love to visit with you more about that. Let us pray. Father, we want to be light. We want to be in the ministry. We want to be doing what you have for us to do. We want to find purpose in that. In your name, amen.